In this section, we'll talk about service endpoints. If you think about the original design of the TCP IP world, you had an IP and a port, and what that mapped to was a PC, so the IP address represented some PC that was accessible on the network, and the port mapped to some service that happened to be running on that PC. And this was designed to allow a client to talk to a specific service on a specific PC. Um, and on one IP, you can't have two or more services that are listening on the same port at the same time. Right? This was a limitation that was built into that, otherwise there'd be ambiguity. If you had two services listening on the same port, when a client request came in, we wouldn't know which service to send the request to. Right? The machine wouldn't know. Um, however, that made sense many years ago, but today, we have one PC, and that PC can be hosting lots of different virtual machines. And one virtual machine can be hosting lots of containers. And each container can run its own service, and they all may desire to run on the same port. So now we have this kind of multiplexing issue where a client request comes into the PC, but it's for really for a specific VM, for a specific container in the VM, for a specific service running within the container on the VM on the PC. And somehow we have to sort all this out, and we want to allow multiple, let's say, web servers listing on port 80, each running in different containers or on different VMs to be hosted on a single machine. So the original networking stacks weren't really designed to handle this. And so what has come up over time are various virtualization techniques to virtualize these IP addresses in ports. And uh, as I say on the slide here, some people refer to these virtualiz virtualization techniques as really hacks. Right? It wasn't really designed for this originally, but now we're trying to make networking work this way, um, even though it wasn't designed to. So, a lot of these virtualization techniques or hacks are things like the introduction of routing tables, we have source network address translation, we have destination network address translation, we have modifications to client code where you actually have to modify your source code to look for a different IP or look for a different port to go and talk to it because it could be on lots of different ports on the server machine. Um, really, this has all become very complicated with different technologies that work in slightly different ways. Some require modifications to source code, some just require modifications to infrastructure. When something doesn't go right, it's very hard to debug it and diagnose it to find out what went wrong. Um, it's caused a, a lot of problems for people over the years. We really need something better. Uh, however, we have too much legacy stuff around, so it's very hard to innovate in this space and come up with something better. You know, network cards have been around for a long time and they work the way they do. Routers and switches have been around for a long time, they work the way they do. Same is true with the domain name service protocol, DNS, um, other protocols as well. Uh, Etc. And so for the foreseeable future, the hacks are just going to continue and more virtualization techniques to try to make this better are going to come along. We just have to learn to live in this world because it just is the way that it is. I have this note at the bottom, beware, that service addressing and discovery, that is finding the address of a service within your cluster and discovering that and then talking to it, is really a lot more complicated than what people think it is. Uh, and we're going to go into some of those issues uh, very shortly. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit more about service scalability and high availability. Right? These are the two you know, holy grails of distributed cloud applications. Right? We want them to dynamically scale and we want them to be highly available. Um, to make things worse as far as the service endpoint discovery goes and communication, we now run multiple service instances of a single service. So if one service instance goes down, we have other service instances remaining to handle that failure until the orchestrator goes and heals the thing that's broken. Right? And we do this, of course, for service failure and recovery, and we also run multiple instances so that we can dynamically scale up to handle a large client load or scale down in order to save money when we don't have a large client load coming in. Well, this means since we're running multiple instances now of any given service, that the instance endpoints, they 
dynamically change over the service's lifetime. We scale up and new IP addresses show up. We scale down and those IP addresses go away. Or the orchestrator moves our service around from one node to another and the IP address goes and changes. Right? Um, an instance fails and comes back up, the IP address is temporarily not working, but then it comes back up and it's back to functioning again. Right? So these are the things that's just dynamically changing all the time. Failure is always inevitable, so we have to embrace that this just happens. Um, and then we have to code for it so that we can handle it in a robust way. Ideally, these IP addresses and possibly ports changing all the time, we would like to abstract this away from client code. So the, we don't have to write a lot of code to do this, right? We would like it to just kind of work for us as best as possible so the software developer has an easier time with it. So there are several ways to go about doing this sort of thing, and one of them is that each client wants to have a single stable endpoint for the face of the dynamically changing service instances endpoints. And typically, this is accomplished using a technology that is known as a reverse proxy. Um, now, the nice thing about the reverse proxy is it puts this abstraction layer inside your cluster, which is nice for the client application code and also for the server code. Um, that's the good news about it. But there is a downside to it, and the downside is that every network request now goes through the reverse proxy, and this causes an extra network hop. Right, so that's the trade-off, right? You're having a simpler programming model where you don't have to deal in your code with the failure as much, and the downside is the reverse proxy is dealing with that for you, but it's introducing an extra network hop into your communication, which can hurt performance a little bit. So we are losing some performance in order to gain a lot of simplification, and many developers find this trade-off to be very desirable, so they accept it uh, into their life. So in this case, the client is using some kind of domain name service, DNS service, that has to be at a well-known static endpoint uh, in order to get the reverse proxies endpoint. And then the DNS endpoints are usually cached in the client, and then they are re-resolved infrequently. But it's possible the reverse proxy could move around too. And if it does, you would have to re-resolve its endpoint in order to talk to the new location of the reverse proxy. And there's many of examples of reverse proxies that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, such as a web server. A web server is a kind of reverse proxy, like Nginx or um, Microsoft's Internet Information Server are examples of that. If you use a load balancer, and I've used uh, load balancers at a few places in my slides throughout this course, a load balancer is another example of a reverse proxy. And then API gateways, uh, if you use any of those, those are another examples of reverse proxies. So on the next slide, I'll talk about reverse proxies, and I will also introduce the concept of a forward proxy, and I'll give you some ideas of what these things are used for.